we take great pride in continuing the Deborah Vasquez's work to bring poets of the highest accomplishment to Central Florida. U.S. Poets Laureate, National Book Award winners, and others of international renown. Some poets impress their readers with the delicate craft of extracting nuanced meaning and unexpected lyrical beauty from ordinary language. Other poets grip us by unleashing the power and endless possibilities of motivation hidden in the word. Nikki, fin Nikki Finney is a poet who does both. Finney was born in South Carolina within listening distance of the sea. A child of activists, she came of age during the civil rights and black arts movements. At Talladega College, nurtured by Hal Woodruff's Amistad murals, Finney began to understand the powerful synergy between art and history. Finney has authored, among other things, four books of poetry. On Wings Made of Grace, Rice, The World is Round, and Head Off and Split, which was awarded the 2011 National Book Award for Poetry. She holds the John H. Bennett Jr. Chair in Creative Writing and Southern Letters at the University of South Carolina. Kwame Dawes, our Deborah Vasquez poet last year, called Finney, one of the most eloquent, urgent, fearless, and necessary poets writing in America today. I'm sure that after tonight's reading, you will certainly agree. Ms. Finney will discuss and read from her work, and then we'll have time for questions and answers. Afterwards, please join Ms. Finney in the lobby where you may purchase her books and have her sign them for you. And now, please join me in welcoming Nikki Finney. Thank you very much. How are you? Good. Thank you for coming out tonight. You're very welcome. Um, I love backstory. You know it, backstory. You'll find, my, you'll find that I'll be talking to you throughout the evening. It's not just me that has come to read to you, but I really love the idea of being in dialogue with you and having a conversation, making a conversation. So I love backstory, and I have to tell you some backstory before I read some poems. Um, when I was contacted and invited to come tonight, I was off the road. I'm not doing any more readings right now. I'm in what I call the writing season. And I got the letter with what this is and this 12th year celebration of this uh, citizen of the community and poet, what it was about. And I put my little green flag back out and said, OK, I'll come this one time, then I'll get off the road again because I wanted to celebrate Deborah ba Vasquez's life with you. I wanted to remember her tonight, even though I never met her. And I wanted to tell you this. I, I don't know if it's absolutely true, but I don't know of any other poetry, annual poetry celebration or reading that celebrates the life of a victim of domestic violence. And I think that you must honor yourselves and celebrate. See, one of the things about domestic violence is nobody wants to talk about it. So it's such a secret and there's so much shame involved in it that who in their right mind would have a celebration of a woman who would um, talk about that her life was taken in this way? Well, it takes great courage, um, great, co great commitment on the part of people at the top and the people in the middle and the people all around to make this happen. So don't miss that point because I do a lot of poetry readings and I've never seen this happen before, which is how you got my attention in the first place. So I thank you for the commitment that you have to Deborah's memory and to her work. And I'm honored to be what in the South we say in that number of the, the poets who have come to talk about poetry, to talk about our work, but to also align ourselves with um, so wonderful a human being's story. So thank you. I, um, I have to start my reading by telling you about Uncle Freddie. 
And um, Uncle Freddie in my family, first of all, we all have families where there's one person in that family where if you have a family reunion or if the family is gathering for a wedding or a funeral or when that person comes in, everybody starts to whisper. Right? Like, oh, Uncle Freddie's here, you all. Be careful. You don't know what he's gonna do. You don't know what might set him off. So everybody just starts whispering. Well, Uncle Freddie in my family was that person. Uncle Freddie, I never saw any money in his hand or in his pocket anywhere. He was not associated with money. He thought money was, you know, the root of all evil. He was a farmer. He lived across the road from my grandparents. But what he always had in his back pocket was an almanac. Uncle Freddie did everything by way of the almanac. I would call him from college. My, the road ran right by his door. And I would say, Uncle Freddie, I'm coming to see you. I'm, I'm going home to see Mama, and I just thought I'd stop in and give you a hug. And he'd say, wait a minute. <laughs> and you could hear the almanac in the background. And he would say, no, baby, it's not a good day. <laughs> I'd say, OK. Uh, I'll call you on my way back through and maybe he'd say, okay, you do that. And so I called him on my way back through and he said, yeah, you know, the moon is perfect. Come on through. And so this particular time I went to Uncle Freddie's house, drove up, parked the car, went inside, and he took me in the room where he took no one, the back room. And he reached up in the closet, pulled down a plastic envelope, and it was a paper where he had written in a community college like this. And at the top of the paper was a big red F. The title on the paper said, one day when a man walks on the moon. And he gave the paper to me because he knew I was the next generation black sheep in the family who was gonna be talked about like he was talked about. And he said, Sweetheart, when you know something in your heart of hearts and nobody else believes you, hold on to it. This is called The Black Orion. The star man was Frederick J. Davenport, 1903 to 1992. Uncle Freddie's favorite word was slave. He called everybody a slave because he said we were all attached to things. So don't miss how he uses this word, the true definition, the original definition of this as, as it comes out in this poem, The Black Orion. In his orbiting eyes, we are all slaves. And there are more new ones of us born every day slavish to things we cannot do without, slavish to whatever is new and fandangled, polished and pearled. In his cornfield, while waiting for grouse to stir, to shoot and freeze for Christmas, he told me, I am leaving a world of slaves behind, girl. So what am I really leaving? Each of you, he said, are every letter of the wanting rainbow. No wonder you define your loneliness by what you do not have. There, at least, he said, I'll be around things that ain't so beholding. A star man has lifted off the ground. A brilliant man is walking weightless through his own clouds. A man who did not know that things had ever changed because he beheld the sky as something that may shift, but was forever dependably exact. A man who did not believe that things should ever change, his only concern was up. His channel was the shifting sky and the always ground. He found scripture in the tissue thin pages of the almanac. A man who did not want to know the answer to it all, who liked it the old way, just fine. In college astronomy, 1959, Fred J. Davenport wrote a paper. He predicted that in 10 years, more or less, 
a man would walk on the moon. And would he be a slave to uncle? Of course he would, he said, if he turned around and came back here. Handing in these dreamy notions to learned men who graded him poorly. Slaves, he said of them all, as he sat before their limited eyes. Slaves would only see it as illuminated soil. The star man saw it as real and therefore walkable. His prediction missed by only weeks. This blazing, unfettered man who spent his life staring at the sky more than he kept up or eye on any human spheres knew he scared me how he always knew. Don't you get on the road, girl, until Lyra lines up with Orion. Yes, sir. Barley colored and bespeckled, tin caps and goobers always falling from his pockets, his cracked shells, his human droppings all over his land. This, he would say, this is the real money. At night, he would stand before the sky, arms folded and alone, a motionless dragon nostriling the dark, breaking bread at his terrestrial table and tossing Dr. Carver seeds as he came and went, preaching always about the arrangement of above and nothing else. His white corn silk hair moving down wind like a cloud of gas and dust. The black Orion who planted taters and melons by the aggregates of lights and darks, by shooting stars in the aurora australis, explained to me that I was a slave because I could never stay long enough to see his meteors shower. Because I could never come and just visit him alone there in his pine tree galaxy, teeming with red dust bowls and candle flies, and to his unbuttoned eyes. There, it was always too sacred and dark, too perfect and complete for my hardbound, no-count books. So many times I came up his road, a skinny, empty-handed woman, and left a fat, imaginative girl with too many presents for my arms to carry. One Sunday, I call home I hear mama say, he's gone, baby. The star man left the ground today, lifted off without me, just like he said he would. Gone up, away far now, far from all of us, clinging, sightless slaves. <clears throat> I still, um, I know we're living in 2016 and social media and Facebook and Twitter and all those cantankerous things, but um, I still talk to Uncle Freddie on a crystal night when the moon is full and the stars are out. I feel like um, that is our moment to reconnect. And I too still read the almanac as taught um, by Uncle Freddie. And when I'm in the grocery store line and I see the new one out, I get all excited like a new song has come out on the radio. My students laugh at me and I tell them that I am keeping Uncle Freddy alive. We can talk about this at the end, um, but I didn't know how to be a poet when I was 15 and dreaming of becoming a poet. There were no poets in my little tiny uh, coastal town of Conway or Sumter, South Carolina. All the poets were dead and in books. And I thought, well, I, you know, maybe I'll get there one day. But right now, I would like to figure out how to, you know, how to write this down and how to arc my life forward um, away from law school, which is where my father wanted me to go, and away from um, the things my mother wanted me to do into being an artist. And so one of the things that I had to do was I had to start finding artists, real, live, breathing artists, working as artists in the world. So one of the things you have to do if you, have, if you aspire to be an artist or a writer is read the books, because you've got to read the books and you've got to read the work, but you also have to come to things like this and go to other colleges and universities when they have an, a real, live artist appear and raise your hand and ask a question. 
because then you, you get into dialogue and you get into communication with a, another person who has been where you are and then you don't feel so lonely. So um, I was in Philadelphia 10 years ago, maybe 15, and you'll, you'll see that if you read my work that I often write about um, women who are caught in some sort of do domestic violence that phrase, even that phrase, is not quite right for me, but I haven't figured out another one yet. But I'm always, when you, when you do something in your life and when you're talking about a subject, you'll find if you have an almanac in your back pocket and you believe in spirit and g being guided by forces other than your own, that you will meet people who will help you answer the questions that your heart is asking. And when I was 15, I wanted to become a writer because I'd gone to my mother, it was the... the um, 60s and the 70s, and I said, Mom, why are people so mean? I can't figure it out. I mean, they're just mean. And she said, uh, you're going to have to figure that one out yourself. She tried a, a response, so I started writing. I started watching people, and I started taking notes on people, and that's how I started um, um, manifesting uh, what I, those questions into, into poetry. So I was in Philadelphia, just like this, doing a reading, and it was cold, it was a snowy night, and this woman came in and she had a coat on and boots and she, she just went to the back and stood up. She didn't come and sit down like everybody else. And I saw her, because I'm aware of my, my surroundings, but I didn't think anything of it. And then afterwards, she came up to me, after the line, after the book selling line, I call it, and she said, this line that became the epigraph for this poem, she said, hey, you write like a black woman who's never been hit before. And she waited for my response. And I went back to the hotel and I wrote this poem called The Girlfriend's Train. And the, gir and the train in this poem is the only thing that didn't happen in that moment when I met this woman. I read poetry in Philly for the first time ever. She started walking up all the way from in back of the room. From against the wall she came, big coat, boots, eyes soft as candles in two storms blowing. Something she could not see from way back there but could clearly hear in my voice. Something she needed to know before pouring herself back out into the icy city night. She came close to get a good look to ask me something she found in a strange way missing from my black woman poetry. Sidestepping the crowd, ignoring the book signing line, she stood there waiting for everyone to go, waiting like some kind of representative. And when it was just the two of us, she stepped into the shoes of her words. Hey, she said, you write real soft, spell it out kind, no bullet holes, no open wounds in your words. How do you do that? Write like you've never been hit before. I could hardly speak. All my breath held ransom by her question. I looked at her and thought, there must be a train on pause outside somewhere where she had come in from. A train with boxcars that she was escorting somewhere when she heard about the reading and came in. A train with boxcars carrying broken women's bodies, their carved up legs and bullet riddle stomachs momentarily on pause from moving cross country. Women's bodies, brown, black and blue, laying right where coal, cars and cattle usually do. She needed my answer for herself and for them too. Hey, she said. We were just wondering how you made it through, and we didn't. I shook my head. I had never thought about having never been hit and what it might have made me sound like. Do you know how many times I've been stabbed, she asked me. She raised her blouse all the way to her breasts, the cuts on her resembling some kind of grotesque wallpaper. Hey, she said. How many women are there like you? Then I knew for sure. She had been sent in from the Philly coal by the others on the train to listen, to stand up close, to make me out as best she could. 
She put my hand over top hers, asked could we stand up straight back to straight back, measure out our differences right there and then. She gathered it all up, wrote down the things she could, remembering the rest to the train load of us waiting out back for answers. Full to the brim with every age of woman, every neighborhood of woman whose name had already been forgotten. The train blew its whistle. She started to hurry. I moved towards her and we stood back to back, her hand grazing the top of our heads, my hand measuring out our same widths, each of us recognizing the brown woman latitudes, the black woman longitudes in each other. I turned around, held up my shirt, and brought my smooth belly into her scarred one, our navels pressing, marking out some kind of new equatorial lines. So example of, we always think that um, we have to look far. I tell my students, they always like, I want to write a poem about New York City. I was like, you've been in New York City? No. <laughs> but that's where poetry happens. It's like poetry happens everywhere. But you have to honor yourselves and the places you come from to know that. And so you don't have to write about over there. You can write about right here. But you first have to think that right here is honorable enough to write about. And that is the journey. Because so many people have told you, told them, told us, that this isn't important enough to write about. So we have to write about New York City. I'm always, um, when, I first, when I started writing, I was, my first book was published and I was 26, which was really unusual to have a, um, a large press like William Morrow pick up a, a first book of poetry. And I remember I, um, at my first reading, a man stood up in the back of the room and said, you're not going to make it very far if you keep writing all that political stuff. <laughs> and I asked him his name because my mama raised me to be polite. And he told me his name, and I wrote it down in my journal book, which I've been keeping since I was about 15. And every now and then I go to that page in that number 37 journal book, and I thank him for blessing me and asking me that tough question because I came up at a time when to write about political things wasn't unusual. Um, my thing was that I wanted to write about the hard thing in the most beautiful way possible. And that's what I've been trying to do um, for 30 years. And that's what I um, still long to, to do in the, in, the, in the right way. So there was a, um, I'm from South Carolina, and I don't know if you follow the news, but um, the Confederate flag was a huge symbol in South Carolina, uh, still is, but it was um, first flying, it first flew over the State House for many, 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 many years, and then it was moved to the State House grounds just in front of the State House. And, Back in the 1990s, there was a huge demonstration where the pros and the cons took place on this because they wanted to take it down. Some people wanted to take it down, some people didn't. And I read, um, I like epigraphs. I like those things that come right before po the poem begins. I call it a window into what I'm about to talk about. And I have a, a, another book that I just collect epigraphs in that I don't know what poem I'm going to use it for. But I'm so fascinated with what it says, I'm just, I'm a collector of those things. And you'll hear a couple of those tonight. Well, um, Arthur Ravenel, the Republican senator from South Carolina, called the NAACP at that rally, the National Association for Retarded People. He later said, I made a mistake and I feel badly about it. He said, I said retarded people and I have a retarded son. He added, that does not mean I'm apologizing to the NAACP. Now this would, this, that setup would make you think, oh, I know what she's going to write about, right? This is like too easy. But the thing about an artist and a poet 
is that I love to come through a window. I don't want to come through the front door or the back door. That's too easy. That's too predictable. I'm going to write something and I'm going to be on, you're going to think you know what side I'm going to be on before I read this poem. But my job as an artist is to not be predictable and to surprise you. At least that's what I hope to do. So this is a poem called Hate. And that's the epigraph of this poem. How does a father with a son struggling to be seen whole in the eyes of the world forget the son long enough for a slip of the tongue to be recorded forever for posterity's sake? How does a father think that a son will never know what he said that day at the rally when he slipped and he, the father, revealed his true feelings about he, the son, the same feelings he feels about other different people? How does a father slip off one tongue while he is rallying his Confederate troops and slip on another later after the rally when he is home with his son, gentle inheritor of his name? He does not. The slippery tongue is one and the same. What could make you forget your son? A fight over a flag? The heat from a simmering hundred-year-old war? Hate stops at nothing, not even the sacred door to a son's private room. I, I love um, I love and hate the news, you know. I don't watch it, and I something I'll you know be I'll be somewhere and I'll hear something and I'll go, what was that? And I have to go find out what that was. And so um, I want to read another um, disturbing but hopefully uh, insightful poem. I heard on the news one night that a father by the name of Dr. John Johnson, he was on the CBS Evening News and he was talking about his daughter, Lavina Johnson, who died on July 19th, 2005. She was the first female soldier from Missouri to die in Iraq. The Army ruled her death officially a suicide. She was awarded the Good Conduct Medal and the Army Commendation Medal and was made a private first class posthumously. When her father, Dr. John Johnson, retired Army, received his daughter's body at the funeral home, he began asking questions that nobody else had bothered to ask, questions he has not stopped asking. This is called Florissant. This is the town that uh, Lavina was born and raised in. Uh, it's the name of the Missouri town, and it is also French for abundant for Lavina Johnson, 19. Before or after, he used the back end of an M16 and struck her in the face. Before or after, he took his fist and knocked her 19-year-old teeth out, breaking her nose. Before that, the Florissant Missouri honor student who loved to play the violin, who every year made time to walk with the American Heart Association, decided to put college off for a while, decided to serve her country first. She enlisted in the army. She was deployed straight away to Balid, Iraq, where for all of her six weeks, she was a communications specialist. Lavina called home every day, her mother Linda answering. So glad to hear her happy, upbeat daughter say, Mama, I think I might be coming home early. The five foot one inch, 101 pound American Heart Association volunteer was found in a burning tent with bite marks on her upper body, the arm and elbow that once held her violin now broken and distended, her 19 year old genital area badly bruised, lacerated, the army report read. Before he struck his match, this was the only time he was dutiful. He was careful, sincere, 
lifting her hips with one hand, perhaps, to pour the hot lie into her womb, clearing all evidence away of his having been there. After all of this, the army report read and still reads, suicide. Dr. John Johnson, father of Lavina, filed for his freedom of information, then wrote another report. Let's call it the father report, a report a father should never have to write, a report a country should write. The army reported the bullet hole was found on the left side of her head, and it was made by Lavina's army issued M16. My Lavina, Dr. Johnson said, was right-handed. How do you take a 40-inch M16 when you are right-handed and curl your 5-foot, 1-inch arm magically around in the air and shoot yourself on the left side of your head? The Army man, the father, will tell you more, much more, if you have the stomach for the details, if your love for your country does not impair your higher affection for the facts. The hole in Lavina's head was made by a pistol, an unfound, unlooked-for pistol. Dr. John and Linda Johnson made the Army release the photographs from the murder scene. The bloody pictures show the bloody path where Lavina was dragged through the woods to the tent. The pictures show the remains of dry Iraqi flowers and leaves stuck to Lavina's body as if she was dragged a long, long way. The Army reported that the tent belonged to KBR, private military war contractor, child of Halliburton, and that is where and when the path trails off. The tent was burning, Dr. John Johnson's broken heart and strong voice tells CBS Morning News. The tent was burning. In the burning tent, Lavina Johnson's 19-year-old body was fully dressed, ready as if for the day's full inspection, even though there was only one white dress glove on her right hand glued into place. There are no warning signs nailed over recruitment doors for 19-year-old honor students who grow up believing they should make time in their lives to walk for others, fighting for a better world made of stronger hearts. There are no warning signs nailed over recruitment doors for 19-year-old honor students who grow up loving the violin. The dotted line you signed, Lavina, should have included the report that your father didn't know about until after he saw your autopsy photos. The report that every mother and father and family of every daughter signing up must now learn by heart. So with your right hand over your hearts, repeat after me. Every woman entering these gates has a higher chance of being raped than being killed by enemy fire. Thank you. So about th three years ago, I wrote this poem, and I was reading it to an audience like you. And in the audience was a reporter um, from London who asked, could she write a story about Lavina? And she did. And that story made its way to Washington to a Senate hearing on uh, w uh, violence against women in the military, which just happened a couple of years ago. And so this poem was put into the congressional record uh, on behalf of Lavina Johnson, whose case is still called a suicide. And I, the woman asked me after that how I felt about that. And I said, well, it's, it's, it's an honor for any work to be put into the congressional record. Um, but I really wish uh, Lavina's spirit could be um, put at rest by far more truth coming out about what happened. And if, you, um, if you're interested in this, there's a five minute video on YouTube talks about the family and what the family has gone through as a result of not being able to get that suicide word off their only daughter's life. And so we can talk about this if you'd like, but this is who I am as a poet. I, um, I take things that I think people don't want to talk about and try to make them not easy, because there's nothing about the case that's easy, but try to bring it to us 
because we're all human beings and we're all fathers or mothers or sisters or daughters or sons. And that, you know, the great writer James Baldwin taught me when I was in my 20s that to be a poet was to be in that group of people who spent their lives talking about what it feels like to be human, to be a human being, what it feels like to love, what it feels like to die, what it feels like to be abandoned, what it feels like to be ashamed, what it feels like to get up again and keep moving. And he said, politicians don't do that. Preachers don't do that. Hymnals don't do that. Only poets. And he used the word poet. He meant artists, but he used poets. And in that moment, when I first heard him say that, I always wanted to be a poet because it felt like the most honorable thing I could do with my life is to remind us how alike we are because the world is constantly reminding us what, how different we are. But we have, we share a heart and we share a soul and we share human sensibilities and sensitivities. And this is one of the reasons I fight so hard for the arts to remain in our schools on all level, elementary, high school, college. If anybody starts talking about getting rid of art programs and you're gonna have me turn into my four foot 11 grandmother who was not to be messed with. So in your own way, remember that the arts remind us who we are in similar ways and while everything else is reminding us of who, who we are not. <clears throat> so I'm just going to read um, maybe, maybe one more poem, maybe two, maybe just one more, and then we, I'd love to, to, talk, to talk to you, see what you're thinking. Um, so, I have, so there's a backstory, because you know I said there was a backstory. Um, I might read two if I have time. Um, do you have time? Okay. All right, here's my other um, epigraph. So Discover Magazine is like my favorite magazine in the whole wide world. If you don't know Discover, you can find it. It's science, it's just science, and what is a poet? Why does a poet like science? I loved science um, as a kid. Um, and there's a great article out today on Einstein. Did you, did you see that? Oh, Einstein was right. That's what it said, that two black holes hit like one was, and they, and they, what was it? That you can now hear the universe where before you could only see it? Oh, I'm, I'm gonna go back to the hotel and just write a poem. I know I'm gonna write about this. <laughs> but I'm reading Discover Magazine many, many years ago, and this went into my epigraph book. It said this, breast development occurs commonly and spontaneous lactation occasionally in men under conditions of starvation. Come on. You can't leave that in a magazine. <laughs> right? You got to do something with it. If you're a writer or an artist or a poet, you can't just go, wow, that's interesting. No, you got to copy it over alphabet by alphabet. Breast development occurs, com occurs commonly in spontaneous lactation, occasionally in men under conditions of starvation. Discover Magazine, February 1995. This poem is called Men Who Give Milk. I'm in Toronto at a coffee shop. I see a man walking by. Do you know who Wole Soyinka is? Wole Soyinka is an African playwright, novelist, brilliant Nobel Prize laureate but he has this big afro that spikes out all over his head, and I love him every time I see him. In Toronto, there is a man with Wole Soyinka hair walking one way. A giant garbage bag bobbles in his arms. Now and then he looks another way behind where another bag sits. He does not turn for it, not then. Instead, he pays attention to his future, walking, walking. Down the street he goes tipping, a tightrope walker's agility. His bag, as bulbous as a giant's eye, cannot help him see. People with steaming cups and toasted breads push to not be in his way. 
His whole wide world is on the move. I keep one eye on him and his moving bag. The other eye is kept on the bag of his corner past. He reaches the end of the street, sits the bag in his arms down on the corner, gentles it as if it is the sack of the last time he heard the high yellow and coral orange of his mother's laugh before when his world had a lock, a key, a ceiling, a proper place for her to cup his lion-eyed face. As he leaves, he pats the bag on its belly, U-turns, walks two blocks back to the other bag, squats, picks that bag up, turns forward again, once again, walking, walking. His walk is strong as if he has children, three. One, life to, one wife to love until the end, a 30-year mortgage, a niggling boss. Keep your shiny quarters, his feet sing out to the bread pushers. He does not stop at the first corner or the second corner with his first bag. He walks beyond into his future to the third corner where he sits the bag in his arms, the bag of his dreams, down. He settles his hand on this bag's spine as if it is that day in the country with his father when it was about to rain. This is how to shift and glide, the old man says to him. The old four-speed truck lurches like a bullfrog. Two hours of repeat instruction and the old man finally reaches for the boy's temple, his hand an onyx butterfly landing on a purple bush it both fears and fancies. This is the first time his father has ever touched him. The boy's able parking between the two old oaks, laying down the sure smooth tracks of the man to be. The walking man with hair like Wole Soyinka stands and turns away from this noonday flash of the ephemeral. He goes back for the sunshine bag that is fat with his laughing mother, who is always reaching, even now, for his browning and walking face. He walks to the corner beyond the bag spilling with his finally satisfied father and his satisfied father's finally soaring butterflies. This picking up and putting down, this serpentine stepping, goes on until the sun gives up, raises its red-orange hand, going to work in some other hemisphere. All day, all week, the pendant, then crescent, then waning whole winter moon pours. With every step, his feet stitch, then unbraid, the woolly strings of his heart keep moving. His two bags never meet on the same corner. Everything now out of his reach is never out of his arms for long. In Toronto, a man zigzags his way across Canada. In Canada, a black man stitches himself back to earth. That, can you imagine, I just, I saw this homeless guy, he was just walking, but he wasn't just walking. He was walking with intention, and he would put that bag down. He, I said, where's he going? And he'd go back and get that bag. And you realize this was his whole world. He couldn't take them all at one time. Like we have a car, we have a trunk, we have a bicycle. He had only his feet and he was not gonna leave the second bag behind for some reason. So I, as a poet, had to create the reason because the intention was in front of me. And that's what we do. I wanna make you aware of homeless people if you have, if you have the, the, the inkling to look away, back to who we, who we all are. We're all human. There but for the grace of God go I. So I, as a poet, have to pay attention so that we are all reminded of that. Okay, here's the last poem, I promise. So I tried to escape poetry one day. It was haunting me, following me. I was writing. I was like, no, I don't want to, I don't want to write anymore. I want to go do something fun. I want to like, forget about you, poetry. I want to go have some headspace. So I went to the movies. It's 1 o'clock in the afternoon, matinee. Nobody's in there. You know how matinee can be. But it's, the, the movie is The March of the Penguins. <laughs> I say to myself, surely there will be no poetry to be found in this theater today. 
wrong. <laughs> so you get to the part of the movie where it's minus 75 degrees. The father, sweet father, penguin has stayed and saved. The baby penguin has hatched on his feet. And he's like, you know the scene. The mother is off, you know, absconding, you know, having champagne somewhere at the bottom of the sea. And she comes back and she's been eating for months. And the first thing she does is she smells out her family. The second thing she does is she regurgitates all that good fish into the mouth of her chick. And I stand up in the middle of the theater and go, oh my gosh, that happened to me once. <laughs> Nobody's there to see this, thank goodness. <laughs> Penguin, mullet, bread. Somebody likes this one. She pulls white oily meat of mullet off the long, sharp bones of spine. The bones prick. She never once says, ouch, kissing the tips now and then. I watch her long fingers. Seven inches away, my eyes are two glossy olives glued to the delicate woman's mouth. It is summer. Behind her, the white curtains she has made move like seagrass, tall, freckled, waving just beyond. I am camera. She is the movie. She bites, then rolls, placing plump, soft chunks of fish into the side of her mouth. Her eyes grow big from what she tastes. I study her mouth, not her eyes. She chews slowly, never showing what's there. Her tongue twists and falls. My dinner moves in slow, white fish animation. She coos like a woman who can taste any flavor in the world. A woman who can hula hoop in her own mouth. My hand rises, my fingers reach, fall short, then fall again. I want to say, Mama, pull the flesh from the throat, not the belly. The meat there has more juice than the meat around the fins, but she is the Mama. I have no baby patois for what little I know of watery things. I have only 17 months of new desire and only two ways of showing it. It's too soon to tell her how much I miss my private swimming hole. She chews down on the flesh of the fish, packs it around good until it is a perfect caramel mush. Catching some of the juice that falls with her longest finger there at the corner of her mouth, she pushes all of the sweet flesh back inside. Once or twice, twice she pulls out a hat pin sized bone, hiding in the waves of tender meat. Only then does she wear her eureka smile. Holding it up in the air to show me, my wishful eyes rise. Her long hand is circled in light. My body shifts into question mark grateful. My newish eyes lift over and beyond the white curtains that all visitors believe are store-bought. This, she tells me, is why you have a mama. Her empire backbone finally speaks. This is why you must never talk back to me, she says. This is why you must love, honor, and obey me. My job, and her toes pas de deux, is to feed and tell you the stories and keep you away from sharp things that might slip into your throat and never completely disappear. Her eyes plie into the slinky circles of her mouth. The sweet flesh is finally ground. Salt and snapper spit and meal a fine pate. She reaches her long brown fingers deep inside her jaw. Our hinged mouths open, mine prematurely. My fists are flying fleshy verbs in the apple air of her kitchen, bald in sweet anticipation. My chubby legs yoga extend into early orgasmic pose. My chin sets into downward facing dog. 
My begging eyes and dark mauve lips close in slow around her fingers. The pounded succulent fish and spit lands in the center of my tongue. I swell in my first chair ever, fed by the mother who relishes the story of turning her back and leaving me once to swim off a thousand miles, find food, fight off shimmering shark, then swim a thousand miles back just to drop her beak into mine. I am the lucky girl of the high chair. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now it's your turn. You signed a piece of paper before you walked in that said, I will ask her a question. I have it somewhere. I won't pull it out right now. Yes. Um, listen to your work. It kind of reminded me of um, one of my favorite writers, maybe yours too, Tony Morrison. Oh. Because Tony Morrison, I think, writes prose that sounds like poetry. Oh, well, yes. And you, you perform poetry that mm. sounds like prose mm. at the same time. Mm. Is that deliberate, by the way? That's number one. And mm. number two, your acceptance speech for the National Book Award is us legendary. Hmm. Thank you. I would love if you could share an excerpt of that speech because it is just like superb oh. poetry, but it's an acceptance speech. Yeah, really? crazy, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> so I, rather than it's, it's actually um, once, you know, you never know what these, how these things will happen. You don't get up to write an acceptance speech thinking that it's gonna go viral. What is that, you know? You, you don't even think you're gonna win. I mean, you don't know that. But I come from people, and I, this is the backstory for that moment, and it's better, it's not better than the speech, but you know, it's like you don't get to hear this unless the person is live, which is why you go hear live people. But a week before the National Book Awards, I had written nothing. And my friend from college called me. He said, oh, you re getting ready? You got your new dress and your stockings? What, what you doing? He said, you, you got your speech? I said, no, you know, I'm from South Carolina. We're too humble. We're, you know, we would never write a speech. And he said, oh, you don't take yourself seriously. What? Are you kidding? That's all I take myself. All I have is my seriousness. I said, I have to get off the phone now. I have to call you back. <laughs> I got off the phone, and I started thinking about what I wanted to say. And I have to start with South Carolina, because that's my home. And that's where I first learned that black people were not allowed to read. And if caught reading, were maimed or killed. So I thought, well, I'll just start there. And I started there, and I went forward because I had been taught my whole life that you don't just walk into a room and think, this is a, an award for you. This is an award for those millions who died crossing the Atlantic. This is a, an award that you could not hold if not for the people whose names you don't know or do know. So I started there. And that is, and I don't, to this day, I don't know why that speech has done what it has done. There are 45,000 views on something ridiculous like that on YouTube. I don't know what it sets out in another human being. I know what it did for me. And I had no idea I was writing it until the moment I walked into that room. And I said to myself, uh, if I don't win, I will tear this up. Which is, you know, what else are you going to do with it? Except in speech, you don't win something for. So I, it didn't get torn up, and, and I stood and, and you, you know, it is what it is now. But, um, and tomorrow in the class, I hope to talk a little bit about this too, because there was an English teacher in my life who I talk about in that acceptance speech, who I was sitting out on the wall, and it was Friday, 4 o'clock, and hanging out with my girls, and I'd done all my work, and we were going to a party and a dance. 
And here comes Dr. Gloria Wade Gales. Doop, 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 doop. And my friends right here, they didn't care because they were off duty. But I saw her. She, she was my mentor. And I was like, not Dr. Gales. Anybody but Dr. Gales. She walks up. Miss Finney, how are you? Dr. Gales, how are you? Have you read every book in the library? Friday, 4 o'clock. Don't forget that part. Uh, no, Dr. Gales, I haven't read every book in the library. Well, uh, if you want to be a writer, if you want to be serious about your life, I think you're going to have to make a decision. I said, Dr. Gales, I just want to go dancing. I don't, I, tomorrow I'll go. She makes a little twirl like she could only do, walk to the library. My girls start laughing to say, well, what you going to do? And this was a crossroads moment. The dance was going to be there. But Dr. Gales' confidence in me, I needed. And so like a little duckling, I followed her into the library all night. I did not go to the dance. And when I am trying to make a decision in my life to this day, I think about that moment. So I had to thank her. And do you know a hundred other students who had Dr. Gales contacted me? She did the same thing for me. That's a legacy. So thank you for saying that. The, the thing about Toni Morrison is my all-time absolute favorite. Yeah, just... And for you to even put me in the same sentence, you better watch it. <laughs> you have given me the ultimate compliment because I just, I think that she is a poet. I think that she writes in prose. Um, and I think that uh, that's hard to do. It's really hard to do.